Um, we were talking about, uh, you know, different topics that people want us to talk about. And Gwen said, well, these are things that are trending in our group right now. And one of them was liver disease. Another is kidney disease. So that's a, a, another topic. But we decided since we were already late for the day that, and since I did supporters last night, that we would do a, a, a presentation uh, this afternoon on liver values. Uh, some of you, uh, if you're a supporter, you have seen this before, but it it's different every time I present it. So, <laughs> uh, so maybe you'll learn something new that you didn't know before. Um, <clears throat> and we're going we're also going to look at how to treat liver problems using food. And if you have this book, you know that we have uh, recipes for um, for liver problems in there as well. So we'll talk about a couple different things. Um, so what affects liver function? Oh, everything. <laughs> um, but things that adversely affect liver function include all the chemical parasite pre preventatives. That includes topical, internal, um, so things that we use for heartworm preventative, flea and tick prevention, deworming, all of those have to be filtered through the liver. Drugs all an antibiotics, drugs that we use for anything are getting filtered through the liver. The liver is the detoxification organ of the body and then the kidneys filter and spit things out the other end. Um, chemical cleaners that we might use in our house or on our pets. Vaccines contribute to uh, liver damage. Pollution, that's one of those things that we have a harder time controlling. Viruses and um, Bacterial infections, we can certainly have attacked the liver. Flame retardants on furniture, carpets, definitely a huge issue. Pesticides, herbicides, things that we use around the house, outside, inside, if you're spraying for ants, flies, whatever. Um, autoimmune disease certainly can attack the liver just like it can attack any organ in the body. Processed foods, uh, processed foods are huge problem for our pets and their livers. Uh, we have seen so many recalls for um, animals that have had liver damage from foods, particularly from mycotoxins, which are further down on the list, but the aflatoxins, there was just a huge recall for that. So an, a, a mycotoxin is a mold toxin released by the molds that are found on grains and legumes. Corn is probably the biggest offender. And we, um, we like to think that we are getting good ingredients in our processed pet food, but many times uh, if someone has a load of moldy corn or grain or legumes, uh, that gets hidden in the middle of a big tractor trailer load full of grain and it's supposed to be sampled when it hits the pet food facility, but uh, you know they only sample so far down and uh, the very commonly, they're not finding the, the moldy areas of that. Uh, cancer, certainly we can have cancer of the liver. Um, food additives, so uh, BHA, BHT, the preservatives, the dyes that are found in food. And then liver shunts, and liver shunts can be a major shunt or a microvascular shunt, and they certainly will affect liver function as well. Uh, so we've got, um, we're going to look at some of the most common um, uh, lab values that are reported um, when we have lab work done on our dogs. So on the left, that's just a, uh, a picture of some common lab work and where you see the big arrows on there, the ALKFAS, the ALT, the total bilirubin, those are liver enzymes, but we have a whole bunch of them that actually go into um, looking at how the liver is functioning. So the most common one, the first one that I generally think of is the ALT. It's not the most common one that most pet owners think of because the one that you guys see going up most commonly is ALKFAS and we will talk about that one in a little bit. But I like ALT because this one's pretty liver specific. Um, it's found within individual liver cells. So when the liver cell is damaged or the membrane of the cell becomes leaky, then the ALT is released into the bloodstream. And that's when we start to see it go up on the lab values. Uh, steroid containing drugs can also increase ALT values. Um, and is it the drug itself? Probably not. It's probably the damage that it's doing to liver cells. And then I've got microscopic view there of a healthy liver versus the unhealthy liver. So when when you see on an ultrasound report, it's, it says um, 
the liver looks swollen or vacuolated. Vacuolated basically means there's holes in it. And so when you look at it microscopically, the one on the left is, has tons of cells in there. And the one on the right has these big open spots where it's sort of like, where did they go? Um, and they've been killed off. All right, so diseases that can cause increased ALT, diabetes. We do get liver damage with diabetes. Inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, very commonly with inflammatory bowel disease, bacteria and leaky gut getting through, uh, things getting through those gut cell membranes um, and absorbed into the bloodstream, then filtered by the liver, it's going to cause damage to the liver. Pancreatitis, the pancreas sits right next to the um, liver. And so if it's inflamed, then the inflammatory process is going to affect the, the liver as well. Cholangiohepatitis, well, that basically is inflammation of the gallbladder that sits in the middle of the liver and uh, the liver itself. In kitty cats, we get portal triad disease, which is disease of the pancreas, the gallbladder, and the liver. Um, hyperthyroidism can increase the ALT because it does cause damage that, that excess um, revved up metabolism will cause liver disease. Hepatic lipidosis, that's basically fatty liver disease, uh, kind of more similar to cirrhosis, um, but basically fat cells kind of infiltrate and take over. Uh, we see it very commonly in cats if they don't eat for more than about three days. Also in donkeys, donkeys are similar to cats in that way. Uh, dogs do not get hepatic lipidosis near, nearly like uh, some of the other animals do. Severe muscle necrosis. Now this is an interesting one. Uh, so severe muscle necrosis, that would be dying off of muscle cells. So with burn injuries or um, uh, a crush injury where a lot of uh, muscle cells are killed, that will also increase in ALT. All right, so AST is another one. Um, this one doesn't usually go up as quickly. It's also found within the liver cells and is released when the liver is damaged. Steroids don't cause significant increases in this enzyme. So if you're seeing ALT go up and this one is normal, um, particularly if you see ALT and ALKFAS go up, but AST is normal, um, then it may be a steroid related problem. Um, other body tissues can contain AST. So again, this one's not real liver specific. This one can go up if um, there's been extreme exercise. Uh, this is the one where I went to have lab work done after I spent two hours doing a very hard workout in the gym. My AST was sky high and my doctor called me and said I was <laughs> In liver failure. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> so I went back in a couple of weeks after not going to the gym um, and it was just fine. So diseases that cause elevation of the AST, again, damage to the muscles, heart failure, because that's a muscle that's failing, strenuous exercise, and primary liver disease can cause elevation of AST. So ALKFAS, this one is a little more interesting um, because this one will go up um, will we'll go up for a lot of reasons other than just liver disease. So this one to me um, is not as specific, but it's sort of a sentinel that sits out there and starts to, to warn us of, yeah, there's some stuff not going on that's great. Um, so ALKFAS is a bunch of enzymes that are found on the membranes of liver cells, cells of the bile ducts, um, which carry the bile from the liver to the intestine. So if we have obstruction of bile flow and stretching of those bile ducts, uh, we'll get an increase in ALKFAS, but other things that will cause it to go up, drugs, particularly steroids, anticonvulsants like phenobarbital, zonisamide, Keppra, uh, we can see increases in ALKFAS. Um, you'll also get an increase in ALKFAS with a, a pyometra, which is a uterine infection, and if there is a bone problem occurring. It'll also be high in young, rapidly growing dogs. So a lot of times I get um, kind of the, oh my gosh, what do I do about this emails? Because people have lab work performed on their dog in particular pre-op for a spay or neuter and they're doing it before they're a year of age and the ALKFAS comes up high and they say, oh my gosh, my dog's in liver failure. No, your dog has rapidly growing bones. And so the ALKFAS should be high with that and it's absolutely fine. 
So diseases that can cause Alcross elevation, Cushing's disease. This is probably one of the first sentinels that mm, maybe you better be thinking that Cushing's is coming down, down your highway. Osteomyelitis, which is infection in the bone, osteosarcoma, which is a tumor of the bone. That's what we got sitting on this little knee there on that dog. Um, so uh, definitely we have to look at bone. And I said pyometra, it's not on the list, but uh, if you have an intact female who's drinking and urinating more, appetite's dropped off, they were in heat eight weeks ago, um, with or without discharge, if their alkafos is up, you might be looking at a pyo. Secondary renal hyperparathyroidism, which basically is kidney disease that's uh, causing problems with um, calcium. And then liver cancer certainly can cause it to go up. Okay, GGT, would Alkfoss be high in a dog with bone cancer? It certainly can be, yes. Um, so GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase, I love this one. Um, this is associated with membranes of the cells of the bile ducts, as well as membranes of the cells from the pancreas and kidneys. Um, so if we have bile that is stuck, so a lot of times this will be high if we have a dog with gallbladder uh, disease, which is highly underdiagnosed highly underdiagnosed. We just had a uh, big email group um, with our Botanical Veterinary Medicine Association talking about how, how underdiagnosed this is. We have a delivery, so we have a barking. Um, so increased growth or pro proliferation of the bile ducts because the bile duct cells are where this is released most commonly. And then again, steroid containing and anticonvulsant drugs, Keppra, phenobarbital, prednisone, dexamethasone, uh, triamcinolone, temeral P, um, all those kinds of things. All right. So if the ALKFAS is elevated and also the GGT is elevated, your chances of it being a liver problem are 94%, increases to 94%. So if it's just ALKFAS, uh, it can be bones, it can be uterus, it can be a young growing dog, it can be drugs. Uh, and if it's just GGT, it's more likely to be bile duct disease or gallbladder disease. Uh, but if you have both of them, you're looking at probably a liver problem. It could be a bile duct obstruction. It could be a um, inflammation. The cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. It could be primary liver cancer like this picture. And we'll see this with the aflatoxins and mycotoxins, so those mold toxicities. Um, and that's what that huge recall was not too long ago with moldy uh, pet food. All right, total bilirubin. Let's get this guy out of the way. Uh, total bilirubin in healthy animals, red blood cells uh, are recycled about every two weeks. About the average lifespan of a red blood cell is about two weeks. So your bone marrow is constantly producing them. Um, and when they are, they basically die off and are destroyed in the body, they release bilirubin. Um, bilirubin is processed in the liver and released from the liver in the intestines as a component of the bile. So when we have increased concentration of bilirubin, when you see total bili, um, it'll be reported out on your lab reports a couple different ways, but usually it's a T-bill, total bilirubin. Um, you could have a couple things going on. You could have red blood cells that are being broken down faster than normal. Uh, for instance, immune mediated anemia, uh, <clears throat> autoimmune, immune mediated anemia, yeah. Uh, or you could have a problem with the reuptake of the bilirubin uh, from the normal, uh, dying and rebuilding of red blood cells. Uh, and when you have excess bilirubin, you may pick it up in the urine on your analysis and you may see this bright yellow tinge to the skin, to the whites of the eyes, uh, to inside the lips. If you have an animal that is this yellow, you've got a big problem. <laughs> so um, interestingly, my, um, my grandmother on my dad's side died of liver and colon cancer. And she really didn't feel bad. And she was at the hairdressers and her hairdresser looked in the mirror at her and said, how long have the whites of your eyes been that yellow green color? And she said, what are you talking about? And that's how she got diagnosed. Uh, she went to her hairdresser and ended up going to the doctor and that's how they found it. So um, when you see yellow eyes in the whites of the eyes, yellow inside the, the ears, um, this is very common in kitty, more common in kitty cats, I think. Um, 
when they get fatty liver disease, they start getting jaundice like this. Um, and this uh, total bilirubin, when it's being collect, when that pigment is being collected in the skin and in the mucous membranes like this, it becomes very itchy as well. They get very, very itchy. All right, you get off to the side again. Okay, um, so it, other liver enzymes can give us more clues about the interpretation of the bilirubin. If ALT is markedly high as well, there's damage within the liver contributing to the problem. If GG, GGT is elevated, then the problem is more likely that either there's a gallbladder or a bile duct clog. And so the bile is not being released. So in this picture, there's your liver, there's the gallbladder tucked up in the middle, and this is the bile ducts that are coming down and dumping it into the intestine. That's the stomach. Okay. Cholesterol. We generally don't worry about cholesterol too much in our pets. However, and it is made by the liver, uh, when we see high levels of cholesterol, a lot of times it goes along with hypothyroidism. And this dog is giving us the classic symptoms of hypothyroidism, very patchy, bald skin, uh, increased pigmentation and color to the skin. The dog is overweight. It's got dry, flaky skin. Uh, so when we see high cholesterol, if you haven't checked it already, I would check a thyroid level. Um, sometimes it has to do with diet, but our animals really don't suffer cholesterol issues like we do. Um, more likely it's related to another endocrine problem as well. Diseases that are associated with changes in cholesterol. So if we have very low levels of cholesterol, either they're, they're not eating or they're not absorbing their nutrition, or they have end-stage liver disease, so the liver is not capable of producing it anymore. So that would be cirrhosis of the liver. Um, the most common cases of end-stage liver disease that I have seen where we're getting more of a cirrhosis have been animals that have been on high doses of phenobarbital for their entire life. I have had uh, dogs that have developed cirrhosis from long-term use of uh, those types of drugs. I think that potentially we could see it with long-term use of steroids as well. And certainly animals who are very, very, very thin and not absorbing their nutrition, whether it's from um, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency that's not being treated, inflammatory bowel disease, lymph injectasia, or just not getting any calories on board. All right, total protein. Uh, we don't necessarily think of this one as being a liver enzyme, but the liver makes the albumin. And so if the albumin is low, then we have to look at, well, did the liver quit making it? Are we losing it somewhere? What's going on with that? And the globulins are part of um, our immune system. So they're made by plasma cells. Um, albumin should make up more than half of the total protein. So a normal total protein level might be seven to eight. So we'd love to see our albumin be three and a half to four. Uh, and our globulins be the other three and a half to four. Um, albumin serves in the transport of bilirubin, hormones, metals, vitamins, and drugs, and it is bound to calcium in the bloodstream. So on your lab work, if there's a low albumin, you very well may have a low calcium and vice versa. If there's a low calcium, you may have a low albumin. Um, okay, so causes of low albumin. Decreased production. We have severe liver disease. The liver is not able to make it. Um, maldigestion or uh, starvation. Um, if the liver doesn't have enough protein to work with, uh, but certainly EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, where they're not able to absorb the nutrients from their food, then the liver, again, doesn't have anything to work with. So inflammation, some of these uh, inflammatory bowel disease dogs, if they've got chronic diarrhea, they're just losing so much protein. Um, so with increased loss, we can have protein losing enteropathy, which is basically the 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 gut is just losing protein. It's leaking it everywhere. Uh, or PLN, which is nephropathy, and that is protein being lost through the kidneys. Uh, another one that we don't think about as much is Addison's disease. But for those of you who have had animals with Addison's disease, that is when the um, adrenal glands are not working. And so we can have a low albumin from that. Symptoms of low albumin. 
swelling of the extremities. So this picture down here with this thumb, that's called pitting edema. So the, some of us get fat ankles sometimes and you, you stick your thumb in it and make a depression and the depression stays there. That's called pitting edema. In our animals, we will most commonly see it on the hind legs, but you can see it like here on the, on the uh, lower abdomen. There's the thumbprint right there that stays after you remove it. Uh, we can have vomiting, weakness, diarrhea, distended abdomen, breathing difficulty, because protein is what holds fluid in the blood vessels. So when we don't have enough protein to hold the fluid in the blood vessels, it leaks out and it leaks under the skin. Uh, but it also can leak into the abdomen. And so this is a belly full of fluid where the, and you can see this dog is very thin, so the liver is not working anymore not producing enough protein. And then the body is losing the fluid. Here it is on x-ray, all this gray is just fluid. Uh, here's this poor little dog standing up with his big pot belly. Um, and we also can get seizures secondary to liver disease. Let's go back here. So common symptoms of liver disease, poor appetite, weight loss, nausea. So that'll give us the drooling. Changes in behavior, because if the liver is not able to process toxins, ammonia builds up in the bloodstream, it crosses into the brain and can cause all kinds of behavior problems, uh, seizures. Uh, certainly we can see jaundice, increased thirst, almost always with liver disease. Uh, and a lot of times the first indicator that a client will bring their dog or cat in for is, gosh, all of a sudden he's drinking and urinating an awful lot. We do lab work and we see these elevated liver enzymes. Uh, we can get clotting disorders with liver failure and liver disease because the liver is responsible for uh, making a lot of the things that we need for clotting, including um, the albumin and the globulins and vitamin K. Uh, so these are all these purple spots are little bruises. So if you see that, that could be an autoimmune problem. It could be a liver problem. It could be that they got into rodenticide poisoning. So this is what I was talking about with hepatic encephalopathy, which is basically the liver isn't working. We've got a lot of toxins in the bloodstream and they're getting to the brain. And these dogs will do this thing called head pressing. They will literally stand against a wall. They have a headache. They will stand against the wall, press their head against the wall. They'll stand in a corner with their head pressed against the wall. Uh, and this basically their, their system is being poisoned by the toxins that they're not able to get rid of. Um, Interestingly, a dog's liver is able to function even when 80% is consumed by disease. And the liver is one of the few organs that is able to regenerate. So um, when we see animals with liver disease, if we can pinpoint what's going on, we can find a solution to stop the process from occurring, then we can rebuild depending on how much damage has already been done. Okay. So nutritional changes for liver disease. We want high quality protein, really important. We want protein that is well absorbed, well utilized. Uh, we want a very high nutritional plane for these guys. Um, the one time, and it's, it's not about amount of protein as much as it is quality of protein. Um, we would only restrict protein in these guys if they have hepatic encephalopathy where they've got these, uh, their BUN has gotten high, they're making ammonia in their bloodstream. It's interesting, we used to measure ammonia all the time on our lab results and we just never measure it anymore. Um, but I remember in emergency medicine 30 years ago, we could measure ammonia in house if we had a seizuring dog to see if that was a contributing factor. Um, and then we have copper storage disease, which has become much more common and certain breeds are more prone to it. Dobermans are high on that list. Uh, but with copper storage disease, foods that are high in zinc may help bind that. And we wanna feed foods that are low in copper. So we avoid organ meats pretty much for these uh, copper storage disease kids, um, or at least we avoid feeding liver. Uh, dairy and eggs can be beneficial for these guys. Uh, beef heart is high in zinc. Um, so we have to, you know, and some of the seafood would be higher in zinc. So we look for those sorts of things. All right. So TCVM, uh, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine for liver disease. Uh, the liver and gallbladder are the wood element. 
and the color for that is green and the season is spring. So we see for animals who are really out of balance, we might see more liver problems pop up in the spring. Um, so we want foods that are going to support the liver for these guys that are dealing with some liver problems. Um, dark leafy greens, kale, collards, spinach, asparagus, dandelion greens. If, unless they have a copper storage disease, I would include bits of liver in their diet. Uh, that is a little controversial with some people, but like treats like, so I like to use it. Eggs are excellent for the liver and small fish are very good like the sardines. Um, we also, if we have a liver, if we have these high liver enzymes, we want to help drain the liver and things that are draining. If you look in the books, um, asparagus, dandelion greens, mustard greens, radishes, very good for draining. So a lot of times we'll add things like that to the diet if we're trying to drain. Here we go, things that drain. Uh, so most of us are familiar with milk thistle. It's very commonly used. I grew milk thistle. It is a beautiful, very, very thorny plant. <laughs> very difficult to deal with. Um, ginger root, love using ginger root because it's good for digestion as well. Corn silk, we don't think about using corn silk. We generally throw that away, but it's actually pretty powerful for uh, promoting diuresis and flushing of the body. Garlic for dogs, not cats. Hawthorn, uh, we usually think of that for heart problems, but it is very good, again, for pushing toxins out of the body through the um, kidneys. Uh, dandelion root, like I said, milk thistle. Um, so this is one of the recipes from the yin and yang book. It's our liver, liver draining diet. Um, yeah, that's from the book. So I like to use gizzards because they're great tea tonic. Uh, you can use turkey, you can use chicken, depending what sensitivities your pet might have. Gizzard is basically the stomach of the chicken. If your pet had a poultry allergy and you needed to replace that, the best thing to use would be tripe. And then we use poultry liver again, if you had poultry allergies and you wanted to use a little beef liver, you could. And then we have our drainers, dandelion greens, asparagus, celery. Uh, pumpkin, great for bowel function, great for supporting the microbiome. I love to use eggs for these guys. And then we would need to balance this diet with vitamins and minerals. That is not a complete diet by itself. So symptoms of liver blood deficiency. So we were just talking about liver draining. That might be a swollen liver um, where your enzymes are high, a liver blood deficiency that the animal may or may not be anemic on their lab work. Uh, they're probably going to be sluggish. They're going to be hot. They're going to be panting. Um, and this might be a liver that's just not functioning as well. Um, we're going to see dry hair because they don't have blood is moisturizing. Blood is yin. Uh, and we'll see dandruff on these guys. Brittle nails, there's a disease called SLO, systemic lupoid onychodystrophy, which basically me means that we've got autoimmune disease of these toenails is, is what we think of it from a traditional standpoint, but from a TCVM standpoint, it is a blood deficit, a liver blood deficiency. So we get brittle nails, weak tendons, uh, and weak ligaments. So, um, I think that a lot of these dogs that are blowing out ACLs also have a bit of a liver blood deficiency. Uh, I love treating these guys with Chinese herbs, acupuncture and food. They do very well from a traditional standpoint, they would end up on immunosuppressants, doxycycline, um, all kinds of, I mean, they do use some vitamin therapy for it, thank goodness. But um, I think that we do a much better job at solving the problem long-term when we approach it from uh, healing the body from within. So these are foods that are going to help build liver blood, uh, eggs, sardines, salmon, liver, beef, heart, pumpkin, dark leafy greens. So when we're thinking about building liver blood, think of things that are orange, red, and dark green. Uh, beets would fall into there. Uh, so that's what I kind of look at, uh, butternut squash, sweet potatoes, if you feed sweet potatoes, um, those are the kinds of things that are going to help these guys who have that dryness and the brittle nails and the um, 
those issues. Okay, um, that was down and dirty really, really fast. What a too low ALK FAS. Other enzymes are normal. Milk thistle had no change. I wouldn't expect it to. You're trying to drain something that's already drained. Um, so I wouldn't be that concerned about a low ALK FAS, uh, especially if the other values are normal. Um, and so when we say the other values are normal, I would look at, are they in a good normal range or are they at the very bottom of normal? Um, so let's say, and we didn't talk about BUN, but that can play in here as well. Uh, dogs who have shunts, uh, liver shunts will commonly have very low values on things like BUN and cholesterol uh, because their liver is, is not processing things. Um, but then they might have, uh, so, and we didn't talk about bile acids either, but if you're looking for a liver shunt, then a more specific test like bile, acid, uh, bile acids would be the um, test of choice for those. Um, liver shunt dogs on a vegetable-based protein diet supplements with dairy and egg. Yeah, you, you have to be with the liver shunt guys. They cannot process these high protein diets. So uh, we that's the one time when I will use things like cottage cheese and eggs as my protein sources. And those guys do have to be on higher carbohydrate diets. Not ideal, but they're dealing with a disease that is much less than ideal. And with liver shunts, they can be uh, you know, a big problem or a minor problem. Uh, and some of those microvascular shunts can be very, very difficult to find. Um, so I have a client in New Jersey who's been fighting that with her dog for, I don't know if she's on here, I haven't been watching, um, fighting with that with her dog for years. Uh, they can't find the shunt, but we're pretty sure it's there. Um, your son is a clique high with high liver enzymes on meds. Yeah, clique high is common common, common. I've seen a lot of click highs with seizure issues. Um, a lot of them with liver problems and liver and seizures tend to go together. Um, and I think we have a big problem in the breed itself, unfortunately. Thoughts on what causes ALT elevated by 100 points? You got a leaky, like, leaky liver cells. Something is making them mad, they're leaking. Something is causing inflammation in those liver cells. Sometimes figuring out what that is is very difficult if your dog is on dry kibble or your dog is on a diet that contains grains or legumes, I would be very concerned. Is there a simmering mycotoxin problem going on? A lot of these animals, if we get them off dry kibble, uh, get them off foods that have peas and uh, grains and things that might have molds in them, these values will come right down. Um, okay. Nine-year-old Esky just had an ALK fast of 1200, high triglycerides, three plus protein, fine three months ago, diagnosed with Cushing's a year ago. Yeah, that's your Cushing's talking for sure. Um, ALK fast is, uh, oh, hi, Doris. Uh, ALK fast is one of those that uh, it'll shoot up with uh, the Cushing's disease. And that three plus protein, um, I would be checking the blood pressure. It may be that the Cushing's is not controlled well enough. And uh, with that secondarily, we get high blood pressure, which is going to force the protein out through the kidneys and show up in the urine. High triglycerides, uh, I would counter that with fish oils to bind them. Uh, but again, that's the, the the bile is not, you, you may have a cholecystitis, you may have a, a gallbladder sludge going on. So I might look at a, um, an ultrasound to see if we have gallbladder sludge, maybe those uh, bile ducts are slightly blocked and that's why the triglycerides are not being broken down by the bile because that's what they do, they break down fats. Um, intrahepatic shunt, well-managed, however, SDMA is rising. Everything is good for liver is not good for the kidneys. So what do you do? Well, you've got an intrahepatic shunt. So you're probably going to have to be on a lower protein diet anyway, which is going to make the kidneys a little bit happier. Um, and uh, I would not worry about restricting phosphorus unless you are having elevated phosphorus in the blood. Um, don't go too crazy about that phosphorus thing early on because you will make yourself kind of crazy. Can trazodone cause high liver values? Any drug can, and yes, that one can. And I, so I would be monitoring in my practice, 
any animals that we had on chronic medications, we wanted lab work every three months because if something is going wrong, going haywire, starting to go up, uh, I want to know early so that I can be very proactive. So if you haven't had a chem screen, CBC chem screen urinalysis done recently, I would recommend it. And for any of these animals on chronic meds, we recommend every three months. And I know that's very difficult right now. Um, because the veterinarians are so backed up and you know if you if you go in to get blood work today you better make your appointment for three months from now now because that's about how long the waiting list is at some of these places so alt went from 277 to 207 to 167 uh you're doing great you're going the right direction um i would still work on draining that liver whether it's with food or herbs uh but 167 doesn't scare me i had a doberman with chronic active hepatitis never went below 900 his entire life uh, so some of these guys, we, you know, I've seen dogs with 12,000 and that's scary. Uh, when you get there, I'd be scared. Uh, ALT 646, high out fast, 2118, GGT 40, high cholesterol, getting an ultrasound right now, always cold. Yeah, you definitely got something going on there. Um, always cold, so he's probably not a blood deficiency and probably not a Cushing's, although with that Alkfoss where it is, I would be concerned and it looks like you're probably gonna end up with <clears throat> maybe some gallbladder sludge in that one as well. So it may be that you've got a gallbladder problem that is uh, contributing to that. Does this apply to humans? Yep, yep. Uh, although I, I will defer to our uh, human uh, doctors and nurses who deal with this all the time as well. Um, I think we have even more specific markers for people. Uh, can acetazolamide increase liver values? Bet tells me no, but maybe that's the reason our liver enzymes are high. Um, I would have to look into that more, Chris, but certainly you can, um, acetazolamide's a, a human medication. So put it in your search engine and look for, um, you know, side effects of the drugs and it, it should come up or you can look for the um, the insert, the drug insert, uh, package insert for that particular drug and it'll tell you all of that stuff because they do have to test that. Okay, I uh, gotta get going. Um, Susie doesn't show any symptoms. ALT 249, Alkfast 1214, GGP is one. Great. Um, I think her Alkfast is high for a lot of other things and it's non-specific her alt of 249 joyce i doesn't doesn't set off fireworks for me uh ggp of one is great gallbladder is working um was okay last april when seen by dr candle now not so good getting blood work next month with elevated enzymes may not want to do teeth cleaning yep ultrasound coming soon well you know where to find me joyce <laughs> okay um what can be done for gallbladder sludge? Again, it's draining. Uh, we, we Phlegm drainers, because it's a sludge, it's a phlegm. So phlegm drainers, uh, things to resolve stagnation. So, okay, I'm gonna get going. Uh, we're still waiting for a delivery, I think. Um, everybody have a wonderful weekend. Um, I, there's no way I can figure out how to do music at this point. <laughs> So everybody have a wonderful weekend. Uh, stay well, and I think it's supposed to be nice. Enjoy the nice weather if you're somewhere with nice weather. And um, no gold. Oh, that's right. Susie had hers taken out. Good. Perfect. Okay. Bye, guys.